Ah, there we are. Okay. So, um, before we get started, I'm going to have a, to apologize a little bit. Um, if you look on the schedule, it says that um, I'm going to speak about MBD and how and try to compare it against Debian, um, which was the grand idea that I had when I submitted the talk. Um, but as I was writing up the slides, I realized that it may have been a bit um, impossible to do that. So I, I, I think there's still something interesting there, uh, but the comparison against Debian is, is not uh, part of the talk because it really makes no sense. Uh, the idea of this talk is to see, um, I mean, I've been maintaining MBD for 15 years now, and I've made a few mistakes, um, and I'm here to talk about those mistakes so that maybe you can avoid making the same mistakes. That's essentially what this is about. So, a um, little bit of history. I became a Debian developer in February of 2001. And I'm not sure exactly when anymore. I've, it's gotten lost through uh, history. But at some point in March or April of, 20, of that same year, a friend gave me an old M60K Macintosh, which had a broken LCO4D processor in there, which meant that if you tried to do something with the FPU, um, it would stack fault or bus error on you very quickly. So couldn't really use it. So the next month, I bought me another M60 AK Mac, uh, which came with a hard disk of a whopping 80 megabytes. Um, 80 megabytes is not much, not even in those days. Um, but I tried to build something on that machine. Um, I did not have the, the, the disk space to build anything, so I tried doing it with NFS at first, and that failed. So because of other technical issues that I won't get into right now. Um, so in April of that year, I mailed to the M6AK mailing list saying, hey, I found this nice, interesting thing called NBD. And with that, it works because the issues that we had with NFS don't apply there. Um, I used it to do a build over a 10 megabit network, and it seemed to work. Um, and since I d did this in a way, I started uploading it into Debian, and that was in June of 2001, now just over 15 years ago. Um, something we can learn from that already, actually. Uh, beware of the MCCK Max. You, well, I guess nobody here is going to buy an MCCK Mac anymore. Let me rephrase that, if it wants to do that. Be careful what you play with, you might end up maintaining a network storage system. Probably not also something is going, people are going to, actually there are other network storage systems, MBD is not the only one, there are things like iSCSI and Atto over Ethernet, but I don't think people here will be interested. The real lesson from, to take home from this is that if you just play with something, um, even if you think it's not useful at this time, it's actually a good way to figure out new things to, to, to put into Debian. I do think that by maintaining MBD and by adding support to several things, I've improved Debian in, in, a, in, in some ways and wouldn't have been the case had I not bought that 68K Mac so many years ago. Anyway, something else. Uh, when I started MBD, it was totally undocumented. There were some lines in the kernel source code showing you how to run it, but that was pretty much it. The code was not commented, there were no man pages, there were no, there really was nothing. Um, so I worked, this I got from a Git history because it, would, it was way too long. In October of 2005, I added some Doxygen comments so I could at least understand the code. Uh, this was, by the, at that time, I, I t had taken over upstream maintenance. Um, in about a month later, I described the protocol and asked somebody to write an ethereal dissector for me, which happened. Um, Several years later, I wrote, uh, I, I converted that blog post into something that I could add into the code repository. Um, and about a month later, um, for the very first time, somebody started to actually contribute to MPD. Um, before that, I've had like people sending me one or two patches and then never reappear. Uh, but after I added this to uh, the code repository, uh, somebody actually started contributing um, Yes, a significant amount of code. I think he submitted like 50 or 60 patches in the course, over the course of a few months. So that was actually a welcome change. Um, two years ago, we wrote up a Start TLS spec based on the documentation that was there, etc. 
and yeah, and, and since, since, since then, we've actually had more uh, commits related to the, that particular document uh, than to the actual implementation of, of the MBD protocol itself. So what can we take home from that? You could take home that writing documentation is way too hard, so you shouldn't do that, but I don't think that's the right lesson. Uh, you could take home that writing documentation takes time. I, it took me 15 years to, to, co to do it properly, but I also don't think that's the right thing to take home. Um, you could take home that writing documentation takes time away from other things. Um, and I, I think if you look at people in Debian and outside Debian and open source in general, they like to write code, but documentation is this other thing that doesn't really happen. Um, and somebody else will have to do it because I just do the code. Um, you could take that home from, from this as well, but I don't think that's the right thing to, to take home from it. Um, if you write documentation, people will send you patches, if only to the documentation, uh, but often also to the code if the code is properly documented. documented. Um, so you could say, I don't want to have patches, so let's not do that, but I don't think that's the right th uh, attitude in an open source or free software world. I think the right thing to take home from this is that documentation actually allows people to understand your code and understand how everything works. And by writing documentation, you make it possible, easy or even possible for them to understand and help you out. So doing that may actually be more important than actually writing the code. Right. Um, Naming things. Um, the original version of the protocol did not have any way to negotiate uh, certain things. I mean, the server just sent some data to the client, and then the client could either accept that or disconnect and try it again with something else, which was difficult. Uh, so in 2010, th this was during DevConf, by the way, I decided that, it, that enough was enough, and I just created an incompatible change between two protocol ver between the two protocol versions. Um, while I was doing that, I inform informally referred to this as the new style of negotiating and the other one as the old style of negotiating. Um, and then later that year, we found that there was a little bug in the new style and we then referred to the, the fix as the fixed new style. Um, this was originally informally, but over the years, actually, they have now become the the official names. Um, the, there's a fixed new style version of the protocol, which is weird because it's already six years old. Um, it's a bit annoying because it's difficult for me to change it now. Um, and if I'd known that six years ago, I probably wouldn't have made that mistake. So what do we take home from that? Um, be careful what you name things because you're going to stuck with it. You're going to be stuck with it. And it's, if it's a stupid name like I did, it's going to be very annoying and embarrassing, and you're not going to be able to change it easily. I tried, but yeah, too late now. So having a good name is usually a good thing to do. Right. Um, like I said, the old side protocol, old side protocol had a few issues, so I created a new style one. Uh, the intent was always that I would is, uh, eventually deprecate and disable the old site protocol uh, when there were, would not be uh, any clients in the wild anymore. Um, after six years of new style, I thought the time was ready, especially when a bug in was introduced that only existed because of the combination between old style and new style. So I just dropped it from the implementation. And at that point, I found that many third-party implementations of the MBD protocol were really still using the old style protocol and depending on it and we're not ready to move to new style yet. Um, so I probably should have planned that better. Um, there were some issues that I could have avoided. Uh, most of the issues that, that existed have been fixed now. Uh, the implementations have been updated, but I should not have probably, probably should not have done so. Um, so that's something I learned. I mean, if you're going to deprecate something, it's best to be explicit about it, make a plan for the deprecation, publish that plan, let people know that from that time on, they will not be able to use the older interfaces anymore. Um, and don't wait six years with it. Uh, six years is way too long for something to be deprecated because people will eventually think that it's not actually deprecated because it's been there for so many years anyway, right? Um, make it clear in the documentation, in the code, 
in the comments, um, in your .sig, in wherever you can announce it that you might uh, want to deprecate it, well, deprecate it because you, or if you, one final thing you might want to consider is, well, do you really need to deprecate it? I think in this case it was necessary, but maybe it's not, right? Security issues, I've had my share over the years. Um, in fact, the second one and the first one are really the same thing because the first one was fixed on the master branch. Sorry, it was fixed on the release branch and I forgot the master branch. And then six years later, somebody said, yes, yeah, six years later, <laughs> Ian Jackson told me on IRC, oh, I found this weird issue and I don't know, but sometimes it crashes and I go, oh, oops. And it turned out that I forgot to merge the commit to the master branch and well, yeah, well, then there's a second CVA there. And then in 2013, we had one. And in 2015, we had two, but one of them actually was already fixed in 2013 without realizing that it was a security issue. So they had assigned one uh, security number from 2013 back in 2015, which is a bit weird. But anyway, it happens. I mean, if you write a server, uh, security issues will probably happen. Um, there's nothing essentially wrong with that. Um, there's nothing to be ashamed about security issues. Um, just be prepared for it and make sure that um, you know how everything works. The first time I had to deal with a security issue, it took me about three or four weeks before I could get it fixed. By the time we got to the final one, uh, it was a bit quicker. Um, so this is something you might want to be prepared for. I mean, better to be prepared for the worst, right? Uh, it's better to avoid security issues if you can, but, well, they happen. Um, of course, like I said, it's better to avoid them, um, usually by, by doing proper design for that. It's fairly usable to do that. Oh, and uh, don't forget to fix all branches, like I might have forgotten. Um, we're almost at the end now. Uh, there's a few Deb Debian-specific MBD features that I implemented. Um, I wrote some debconf configuration for the client and the server. And when I was doing the systemd MBD unit the other day, I found out that the client version of the uh, debconf configuration was so broken that it must not have been used for like five years or something because it could not possibly generate a valid configuration file. Um, so I threw that out because obviously nobody was using it. Um, I added installer supports and a systemd MBD unit um, and an init script. Uh, some of these features were interesting, but I'm starting to be convinced that DebConf is not as useful as I once thought it was. But maybe some people disagree. I think that's what I had planned for today. Yeah. I still have some time for questions if people have any. But other than that, I think uh, we're done. No questions. I thought that means it yeah, was... Yeah, I'm going to add a question. Oh, good. Thank you. You were talking about deprecation. Yes. And you left it in bits in for six years. Yes. That's what, the third release cycle of Debian. So, you know, the first one you announce it, the second one you leave it then, and on the third you delete it. That's about right, isn't it? Well, yeah, um, possibly. Um, this is, of course, an, an, an upstream uh, deprecation that I'm talking about. Also, um, the way I deprecated it was I, I just added the warning, this is now deprecated. And when I threw it out, it was almost an overnight decision and that might have been a mistake. Um, but yeah, timing wise, it's probably okay-ish, but um, planning it and announcing it and sticking to the plan might have been a better idea. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the biggest fear, in, and we see it on some of the, the faster moving projects mm -hmm. is they announce something, they deprecate it, they drop it, and it's gone in one release cycle of, the, of, of a distribution. Right, yeah, and that might be a bit too quick. Other questions? None? Okay. Either that means it was very interesting or it was very boring. I hope the first. Thank you very much, Dan, um, and see you around. <laughs> <laughs>